we're now live chair all right thank you very much good evening everybody again um so that must be the end over to you um right yeah thanks thanks for coming everybody um have we got any substitute for this i think we've got one haven't we is it yes we do chair councillor yeah. smith has sent her apologies and we've got councillor tremaine substituting on her behalf right okay thanks very much for that thank you that's fine welcome um can I just remind members that need to declare any interests and particularly those pecuniary ones that nobody can pronounce, uh, financial ones, um, relating to anything on the agenda? Have we got any public here, uh, Kirsty? No, just hopefully watching via YouTube chair. Right, okay, right, okay, right. They're welcome anyway. Uh, minutes for the last meeting, which I think you arrived earlier on today. Has everybody had a chance to read them? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Have we got any questions? Uh, it all seemed pretty accurate to me. Yeah, I thought they were pretty good as well. Yeah. Who wrote mm. those, Kirsty? Was it you? Well done. Yeah. Because it's not easy, is it, doing minutes? Oh, is it? oh right. Yeah, well done. Um, I hate doing that. Um, right. Well, we might as well go straight into the uh, into agenda. Um, the first thing is the um, public services priorities. Are you doing that, Zora, or I think you are, aren't you? Are you presenting? Uh, yes, I can take you with, through it. Um, uh, I've got Andrew and Sarah with me, and of right. course our cabinet member, Councillor Lynn. Um, right. So okay. Well, whoever, yeah, that's fine. Okay. You know, that's fine. So if you want to uh, start, that's fine with us. Thank you. So have you got the presentation there? I've got, uh, well, I've got a copy, presumably everybody else has had one. It's, in, it's on the um, meeting calendar, isn't it? Okay, so I'll just talk you through it then. And I said, anybody, does anybody want it sharing or have you got it? I think we should share it as we're talking about it. I'm, I'm happy with either way, whichever you want to do, whichever is easiest for everybody. Have you, can you share it, Zora? I'm hoping that Kirsty can. All right, I wasn't aware that I was going to be sharing it. Just let me find it, just a second. If I just start talking anyway. Yeah, fine. fine. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you and uh, good evening. And for those of you that are, are new to the council or, or watching um, from various homes, I'm Zora Zankudi and I'm the Director of Public Services. And with me this evening, I've got our Cabinet member, Councillor Jenny Lynn. And I've also got Andrew Pitts and Sarah Richardson, our assistant directors within public services. So I think, first of all, um, at the very beginning, you'll see that we've got just a, a quick summary of what our directorate priorities are. So for neighbourhoods, it's getting the basics right and providing the platform upon which communities and individuals can thrive and reach their full potential. And that goes from clean parks and public realm to safe streets and spaces. Customer services is about improving the quality of life, making it easier for customers to access our services and to reduce inequalities. And then our customer culture, leisure services play a vital role in the physical and mental health well-being of our communities. And of course, make an important contribution to the visitor economy of Calderdale. We've also mentioned on their IT and digital, which I know we're not going to focus on tonight because that's not within your remit as such, but just worth reminding ourselves that that's actually part of the Public Services Directorate and, of course, has been tremendously busy over the last 15 months in actually making sure that everybody's able to work from home. If you could just move on a few slides, Kirsty, thank you. On to slide number three. Lovely, thank you. Um, so in terms of what we look like as a directorate, we've, our net revenue budget is 24 and a half million. We have 738.5 full-time equivalent members of staff. We have almost as many again of casual employees, always averages about 600. 
And we have an army of absolutely fabulous volunteers that support us over and above that as well. So we're a big directorate in terms of the, the staff that we have and the services that we deliver. What I won't be able to do tonight, and, and those of you that have looked at the cabinet paper will see, that in terms of what we cover as a directorate, we have a huge breadth of services. We cover everything from your sort of your waste and recycling, transport, bereavement services, register office, sports and leisure, the Victoria Theatre, libraries, neighbourhood services, green space, um, street scene, and so it goes on. And I'm mentioning that just to remind ourselves that, and this is also for colleagues that are watching, that just because you're not mentioned as a priority doesn't mean that we're not actually 100% focused on delivering that particular service. There's only so much we can ever capture in a, any particular document. So what I'm going to share with you are, is just a flavour of the priorities our cabinet have recently agreed through Council Lynn that will be the priorities for this directorate. So next slide, please. Okay, we can go on again. I've already just bounced through those services. Lovely, thank you. So in terms of our priorities then, as a council, we've got our you know, sort of three strategic priorities, which our cabinet have signed up to, and that's about reducing inequalities and the causes of deprivation. It's about our climate emergency and about our sustainable towns. So what we've done is we've just looked at some of the key areas that we as a directorate deliver that support each of these different priorities. So, and this, this again is it's not an exhaustive list of what we do. So in terms of reducing inequalities and the causes of deprivation, I've mentioned already about our sports and leisure facilities. And of course, what we're looking at, and we're very mindful of you know, the government roadmap and how we actually deliver that service in a safe and a COVID secure way. We've reopened our leisure facilities and we're obviously, with everyone else, waiting to see what the 19th of July brings in terms of further relaxations. But we recognise that within the public sector, sports and leisure, we made a, con we made a conscious decision that our services are about enabling and encouraging health and wellbeing of our residents. And to that effect, we subsidise those services because we think it's really important to have accessible services for our communities. We are working alongside our anti-poverty steering group. We've done a huge amount of work throughout the pandemic, helping and working with the voluntary and community sector, helping to support those people that are most vulnerable and have had urgent need during the pandemic. And I know that we did discuss some of that at these scrutiny hearing uh, last night. Um, but that work continues. And I guess what we've seen with COVID is people coming into that system, people, people find themselves in a position of need, possibly for the first time in their lives. So it's about how do we look after those people and how do we actually make sure that we can actually guide them through what can sometimes be quite a daunting and complicated and sometimes bureaucratic process. We do a lot of that through our access to services. And whilst we have telephone contact, we have face-to-face -face contact, as an organisation, and in, indeed you'll be aware, you know, if it's very similar with grocery shopping to anything else, the world is moving to much more of a digital footprint now. But what we need to do is to make sure that that's as easy as possible for our communities, but actually that we've got the safety nets in place for those people that can't access through that, through that channel. So we still do make sure we've got that face-to-face -face offer that's there for those vulnerable residents that we've got. We've led on a number of campaigns and continue to, continue to do so, working alongside partnership organisations such as the Community Foundation, looking at holiday hunger. And again, that's been a really important part of some of the service delivery that we've done. And then lastly on that first screen there, one of our priorities is about looking at school transport and how do we balance the demand against the resource available. And that's there quite simply because in terms of public services as a directorate, our biggest budget pressure pre-COVID related very much to our transport budget. And we need to be mindful that as an authority going forwards, 
it's really important that we do what we can to make sure that we deliver the best service possible, but within the actual resource that's been allocated to us. And what we have there is an area where the demand is increasing and the demand is actually increasing at a much faster rate than the, the resource is increasing for that service. So it's something which we're actually looking at and seeing what we can do and how we can review that. I move on to climate emergency and colleagues will be aware that Cosdale Council has signed up to as a you know, declared climate emergency and we're all unfortunately well versed in flooding and what the impact of that for example means to the residents of Calderdale. So when we look at public services and what we might do to contribute to that quality we're starting to look at our waste contracts now. Our waste contracts, a number of them, come up for renewal in 2024, which, whilst that sounds like it's a few years away yet, the work starts now. The work starts now to look at those contracts, look at that service delivery, look at how it contributes to our priorities, and look at how we can actually get the best service for our residents. One of our budget decisions there, which you'll be aware of, was about actually implementing the reduction of hours at our household waste recycling centres, and we're working with our partners, Suez, to make sure that happens, again, to meet that budget co commitment our cabinet have signed up to. Of course, we want to promote and encourage recycling as part of our contribution towards our climate emergency. And it's something which I think as a council, we perform exceptionally well. well but of course, there's always room to do more. To do more. We're looking at electrical vehicles. We've started to replace our fleet moving towards electric vehicles. Our mayor's car is now an electric vehicle as well, and we're quite proud of that. And we're also piloting things like electric street sweepers as well. So as the electric vehicle market gets better and better in terms of what it can deliver and what it can do in terms of battery capacity, we'll obviously embrace that mindful of the impact on the, on the environment. And then we need to think about air quality and what the role of our services is within that. And this is something about joining up those dots across all of the council services and understanding how we work together. And some of that work for our members will be about looking at what some of those tensions are. So when we're looking at transport across Calderdale, we want to encourage public, public transport. But, at, but we also have within our budget, for example, a target in terms of income for parking charges. So how do we start to actually balance some of those tensions within those priorities across, across the borough? Next slide, please. So sustainable towns, we've got some wonderful market towns across Calderdale. So when we talk about public services and what our contribution is, one of our priorities is about you know, a spring clean Calderdale that we've come out of 15 months probably, which we've never known the like of before. And it's about how we actually embrace and enjoy what Caldwell has to offer. And part of that's going to be our sort of spring clean campaign. It's a national campaign that links into this, but what we're keen to look at is how we can get this going in Caldwell and keep it going. We're looking at our new structure in green spaces and street scene. I always say that the wrong way around, but it is green spaces and street scene. And looking at some of those properties that you'll know from your own inboxes that really matter to people. It's about the fly tipping. It's about you know, that sort of environmental blight and how we get better and smarter actually dealing with it and holding people to account for it. But it's also something about just thinking in terms of when we have a new project, what, what does that mean in terms of ongoing revenue? So you can build something brand new, but you need to actually think about what does that impact have then on street cleaning? What does it mean in terms of emptying bins? What does it mean? And so, and so it goes on. So again, it's about joining those dots up across all of our priorities. Community asset transfers, we, back within this, within this scrutiny um, committee, we've discussed on a number of occasions previously, and I think we've had some fantastic results now in the work that we've done that Sarah Richardson has led on um, with Councillor Lynn and we've really got some vibrant community groups that have now come forward and we're then taking that um, community asset transfer process further. So that's been quite exciting to actually work on. I mentioned earlier on about our contribution to the economic impact of Calderdale. 
And of course, our very own Victorian theatre play, plays a huge role within that. So when we start looking at that whole sort of cultural strategy across Calderdale, it's a really important part of our visitor economy. And you'll be aware from the uh, previous cabinet report that what we're actually doing is we're developing a cultural strategy. And we've agreed that 2024, the year when we at Calderdale are 50 years old, will be a year of culture for Calderdale. So we really want to get that going from one end of the borough to the other and actually you know, get people celebrating that local pride and looking at what we could do to actually help that to generate more income. So we've got great successes with Shipton and other places, but there's so much more that we'd love to do as well. So the challenge for us is, and I, I, this is just a good as what, one, two, three, five words. I reworded those five words so many times before I actually submitted this presentation. The challenge for us is actually balancing the resources against the demand and the expectations that we have. The reality is you know, we can deliver you a gold-plated service, but that costs an awful lot of money. And it's about overall, as an authority, balancing what our priorities are, what our needs are, and making sure that we focus our energy and our resources in the right place for the people of our borough. And I think that's probably as far as I go. And um, Council Lynn may want to add to it. And certainly any questions, I've got Andrew and Sarah here who obviously know a lot of the service detail for you. Thank you. Thanks, Zora, for that. Um, before I take questions, do you want to add to that, Jenny, or should I just throw it open? Uh, no, Chair, I'm very happy for you to throw it open. And big thank you to Zora because she's, she's summarised yeah. the work of the, the uh, director really, really well. Happy to well, yeah, it, it's, a lot, it, it's a very large portfolio and a very, very varied, isn't it? You've got a lot, a lot to go out there. So you did quite well putting that in a bit of a nutshell. Yeah, very well. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments to make, please? Councillor Bellinger, I think you got your hand up. Thank I've you. got you, Guy. Thank you, Chair. Um, great piece of work there, Zora. Um, quite impressive is that, and uh, it's good to know that things are progressing within the, uh, the borough. Um, but one of the things I'm always concerned of, and that is that the whole of Calderdale gets its fair share uh, when it comes to improvements uh, throughout the place. So how do you actually identify which, which areas are, are, are needing some improvements and, and, and financial you know, spending on it? Um, but also with that, how are you going to actually monitor these improvements as well to see if you know they're actually working and, and what's actually doing well and what maybe isn't doing too good? Thank you. I guess it's quite hard to answer that in terms of the whole directorate because each service is so very, very different. So the way that we might, the way that we may monitor, for example, antisocial behaviour as part of our community protection team. As, as a very different approach to the way that we might monitor and review our library service. So I, it, it's hard to answer that in the broadest terms, but what I would say is that on the whole, it's an intelligence-led approach. And the intelligence that we have tells us a lot of information about what our different towns look like, what their needs are. We know where there are higher levels of deprivation. We know what the service footprint looks like in different areas. We know from the complaints that come through to our contact centre where there are areas of great concern. Our elected members provide a great source of intelligence and sort of ear on the ground type of information that comes back into us. And all of that gets fed back in. And that helps us to then understand better where and how we deploy resources. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Guy. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, yes, I thought that was a, a concise and very clear presentation, Zora. Thank you for that. Um, my particular concern of, of, of all the areas you talked about was, was the libraries and the perceived uh, running down and possible closure of, of several of them. And I, I'd just like to be re reassured that you are treating um, libraries with due importance 
in the community because I think they are very important. And um, I, I, like I say, I'd just like to be reassured you looking at this with um, trying to keep them open where you can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we recognise that... Oh, you're gonna... oh, sorry, sorry, carry on. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So absolutely. And we we recognise that how important libraries are within our communities. And I think you know, the huge amount of work that's gone into working with community groups to try and sustain those assets is, is actually a testament to that. Equally, what I would say is that you know, when we think about libraries, it's about a service rather than a building. And sometimes we need to make that, you know, to, to differentiate between those. But what we're keen to do is to make sure that the libraries that we continue to run are as sustainable as they possibly can be going forward. And that's about actually looking at other uses that can go in there alongside our libraries, putting other services in there to actually make them better used. Um, you know, when we look at some of our sort of smaller community libraries, we haven't been able to reopen all of them, but we are planning reopening just yet, simply because of the social distancing and some of the mechanics around that and, and the art of the possible. But we're quite clear that you know, where we've been able to, we've worked with community groups, we've got good strong cases coming forwards, and the other libraries that sit outside of that, we are doing everything that we can to make sure that's a sustainable service going forward because we recognise that it is valued by our communities. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I would like to be... Uh kept in the loop, updated, however you like to describe it, of how this community um, effort on the libraries goes in terms of using all the rooms, keeping the buildings uh, in full use. I can see how that would help. Um, will there be regular up updates on, on this? Or is there somewhere I should go to look for, for how this is progressing? Um, Can I just say that I think I think Jenny's sort of looking excited about getting involved in that one, eh, Jenny? You, you looking to, to comment? Yes, yes, Chair, I will. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, thank you very much, Councillor Beach, for your question. I think it's, and I'm really glad to hear you flying the flag for libraries. Um, I think what I would, uh, well, first of all, in terms of your last question, which is, um, you know, progress reports on it, as far as the community asset transfers that are under consideration at the moment. There's a report which will be going forward to Cabinet um, a week on Monday. Um, and in fact, you know, there's a member of this, uh, uh, of this scrutiny panel who's very involved in the one for Mydenroyd, for example. Um, so there's been quite a lot of, quite a deal of interest in that. So that's one way of keeping up to date with what the, uh, what the plans are going forward for the, um, for the libraries that are going to be community asset transferred. But I would just like to kind of refer back to um, what Zora said about our, you know, the, our um, administration's key, three key priorities. And of course, one of those is tackling, uh, is, uh, is, is, is tackling inequality, really. Um, and when the future councils report went through the council last year, um, one, of the, one of the elements, really, of the assessment that we were making about whether it would be feasible to reopen some of our libraries, but not others. Um, one of the things which, which underpinned that was, a, was us taking a view that it wasn't just about the usage of the library, but it was also about where there, was a particular, there were particular needs. So it's for that reason um, that there's re, the refurb, refurbishment of Beechwood Library is taking place at the moment, um, hopefully be, be finished in the autumn. Um, and why, as far as the plans for the Mixington Hub is concerned, um, the li a library is very much part of that. Um, unfortunately, because of the, um, the fire in the Mixington Library last year, we've had the residents of Mixington having to make do with temporary facilities in the Mixington Activity Centre. Um, but I just wanted to reassure you that we're very, it wasn't just simply a matter of, well, which libraries are most used and which aren't. We also feel it's got one of our um, commitments is to make sure that we um, we do kind of um, take in, take into account the needs of our different different communities. Um, so and I, and I finally just to, to comment and respond, Councillor Beach, to your point about you know the use of the rooms and all the rest of it. I think that very much picks up. I think Zora picked that up really well, which is to say that the library service isn't just about 
the building. And it isn't just about books. It's about people needing to access the computers to be able to do the universal credit job search at, or whatever. Um, and also we do have some, we, we did find during the um, COVID pandemic that there was a, quite, I think I'm right in saying, um, Zora and Sarah, there was quite a significant growth in interest in our um in our um, the library delivery service really as well, so people could people weren't able to to, to access any of the, the libraries could actually sign up for um, for that delivery service, and that's been quite that's been quite well used. As has also the the signing up for the ebooks um, and being able to download. So there's a so the the system the, the setup is moving on all the time really. Thank you. Well, I I, I am encouraged that there's a, a definite commitment here to regards the Mixenden Library and it's definitely going to be a part of the uh, the Mixenden Hub whenever it happens so at least it's it's sort of you're recognizing the importance of it in Mixenden which is encouraging thank you thank you Jenny thank you Guy anybody else got any questions uh Rosine thank you chair um I uh, just had a question around this. You've obviously got three, the, there's three areas around um, inequality and addressing deprivation and sustainable towns and climate change. And I'm, I'm sure that these conversations are happening really in depth between those three areas, but it'd be really nice to almost see the joined up thinking presented. I don't mean in this meeting, I mean going forward, because, you know, if we look at the fact that the people who are the poorest will be the people that face the brunt of climate change, because they won't be able to afford the innovations. They might be living in terrace houses, which is more likely to flood. Um, you know, th there's links between all those three areas. And, and I'm sure that all the portfolio holders and all the officers constantly have conversations about this. But it'd be really useful to be able to present to the public that we understand the analysis and the joint thinking about how all those areas link. Shall I, shall I respond yeah, well, to that, Chair? Um, yeah. Yes. Before I think... you go, Jenny, we we had a I had a meeting yesterday with with uh, some director and we looked at where these areas want addressing. Now they might come to this scrutiny board, they might go somewhere else, but um, we're deciding. I mean, you're quite right; they need looking at. But we're deciding which which scrutiny board is more appropriate because they seem to at the moment be discussed in a lot of places, and it's the same officers doing the same presentations to different boards. So <clears throat> it is something we're looking at for the future. Sorry, Jenny, interrupted you. Not, a, not at all, Chair, and I believe Councillor yeah. Patient wants to come in as well, so I'll keep it, yeah. <clears throat> keep it quick. I think, uh, I think Councillor Cameron is absolutely right. I think the important thing is how it all, how it all fits together. Um, and I know that we, you know, there's the issue about scrutiny panels overlapping, but I personally, and I don't know what the director thinks or what um, Councillor Patient thinks, but I wouldn't have a problem at some stage in the future about us perhaps having a discussion where we take some feedback from yourselves as scrutiny panel members about your views about how these how these three should fit fit together i can assure you that the i mean there's an awful lot in there even the third one which is about our towns i mean i'm very conscious of the fact that for me um, i mean i mentioned about mixenden and about ovenden and north halifax for me is a is a key key area really um that we, we need to be, be thinking about so this is just about the towns that have got the money from the government funds and all that it's about all our borough really um, so yeah, so I, I, I certainly take on board what you're saying about how the three fit together, but I'll shut up now and let Councillor Council Patient come in. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Caffrey. Um, no need to shut up. I'm, I'm aware I'm somewhat hijacking this because this doesn't necessarily fall directly in my directorate. But just to follow up, really, in terms of um, how those three areas intersect, as, as Roisin mentioned before, I think it's I think it's probably right that we do have these conversations in a lot of different places, um, in many different scrutiny boards, in many different working parties, because there is inter sort of sectionality all across the board. Really, it's something I definitely. I've thought about putting on one of the first items of agenda for the climate change working party and I'd sort of invite anyone on this group on this scrutiny board to come along to that it's a really open board and we do have some sort of quite, quite wide-reaching strategic discussions as well as as well as trying to land stuff in in front of cabinet in general really but I mean I do think there's wealth in what um, perhaps um, Councillor Lynn just mentioned in terms of a wider piece of scrutiny around those three intersecting agendas. I think there's a lot to unpack there. Certainly 
in my directorate, which is which they call climate change and resilience, but has housing and the voluntary sector. Um, I think the idea of, I mean, Councillor Kavanagh laid out a bit of it in terms of, you know, um, how it works with um, building sustainable towns and what that means about staying in the area, building the economy of the area, yet also, you know, not having to travel to Leeds or Manchester, equally the inequality stuff as well. So I do think there's the opportunity to have these broader discussions and we need to keep having these discussions. That's the key. I mean, we are, we, we, we say the word climate emergency, but if anyone has seen what's going on in the Pacific Northwest and Canada at the moment, that kind of thing is coming for us. And it's, you know, that, that those places are, you know, on the same longitudinal line as London. So it's it's not beyond the realms of impossibility that we're going to face that. We face flooding, you know, moorland fires. So we do need to be acutely aware of how all these things play and how they do affect the worst off in society. So I'd be very, very much open to, to coming back and having a broader discussion on that. Well, well, when we come to the work programme, we can have a look at that. I mean, as you know, we've got quite a busy work programme. And, you know, we need to include the whole borough here, not just specific areas. So we have to be careful not to isolate most of the population and concentrate on a few. You know, we need to be sure that we're broad and broad minded and we look at everything, not just one or two individual spots that people want to look at. Uh, anybody else want to comment? Everybody all right? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Zora, for that. And thank you for your, your questions. Uh, moving on now to... The next, so I've got to pull this up. Green spaces. Um, we, we've had a, a, t a working party on green spaces recently. I think it started off as um, street scene, then morphed into green spaces. But I think it's all part of the same part of the same. Sorry, overall. Chair. Bro I think you chair. Might have skipped an item. You know, cannot hit. Sorry. I think you might you have skipped an item. item. What have I missed? We've got the service priorities for climate change from Councillor Patience. Oh, sorry, sorry, Scott. I'm sorry. Just... Thank you. I want to turn a jump through. <laughs> oh, with the bridesmaid, never the bride. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. I'll shut up. Kirsten, do you want to start uh, chairing this? <laughs> it, Lauren. My apologies, Scott. Carry on. No, not at all. Not at all. I think I'm on my lonesome this evening, um, but that's right. okay. Um, I'm sorry that um, Councillor Scullion hasn't come along. So I'm. Uh, I'm going to have to replace her um, sweet Scottish accent with my um, annoying Mancunian drawl, I'm afraid. She did, um, she did actually apologise. She said she's away at the moment, so she yeah. said her apologies, which I should have said at the beginning, actually, my apologies. So I, I just thought I'd briefly mention about um, where we're at in terms of um, one of our major corporate priorities, which is the climate emergency, the climate crisis, call it, call it what you will. Um, it still stands as one of the three major corporate priorities. Um, I think it's important to look at it in the context of where we are at the moment, though. I think um, the reality is that the declaration of the climate emerges. So we had a we had a year's run in sort of the real in real life, if you will. And then um, a global pandemic hit everyone around the world. And I think it's important to pay deference to that in terms of what we're doing going forward and how that's changed things about that how, how I mean how it's changed the meeting that we're in at the moment um, and what that's doing for cars on the road although looking out my window there are still quite a lot of cars on the road however things have changed um, I think it's worth remembering the context of now we have uh, a mayoral combined authority and what that means for us too um, in terms of opportunities in terms of the parallel agendas of our climate ambitions, we both we both have set uh, targets of 2038 or 2030 with significant progress in 2030. Um, and I think it's important to recognise as well how we're seeing in the work that we do in tackling the climate emergency. Our, the leader, Councillor Swift, is now going to be the chair of what was formerly the Green Economy Panel. Um, I don't think that's been given a formal name as yet, but I think that's a really big opportunity for Calderdale um, more broadly to speak on a regional level um, to celebrate our successes and to hopefully get the kind of money that we need here in Calderdale going forward and the kind of investment and have that direct line to Westminster as well from our elected mayor. Um, so in terms of what's coming up, um, there's been a lot of work done over the last six months, year in terms of partnership working. I think we've very, very much got the bulk of the voluntary community sector on board. Um, we've been going out and doing a lot of conversations um, with, with Voluntary Action Calderdale and the VSI Alliance. 
Um, we've been going to the Health and Wellbeing Board um, and asking them what they're doing. So speaking to the CCJ, um, speaking to our health directors about what's happening there. Um, and at the, at the same time, we've been making sure that we um, speak to our other partners in housing. So now Together Housing have their own um, carbon reduction strategy in place. And it's important we keep pushing um, our partners and and the people that are critical to delivering this. And that includes our businesses and anchor institutions, our colleges, and keep having those wide, wide reaching discussions about what we need to do. Now, what's very, very helpful at the moment is a piece of work that we developed. Um, for those who are unaware, um, at a West Yorkshire level, um, they developed through the Green Economy Panel, a what was called an emission reduction pathwork. Um, they asked a company called Element Energy to do that work. And it basically has a roadmap of how they get to 2038 net zero. And it includes all the things that you might imagine in terms of transport, energy, land use, community, um, and, 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 and all, all, all across those sectors. Clearly, there's some quite difficult stuff in there for us to get there. It, it relies on a lot of it relies on some assumptions in terms of what's what will happen with technology including hydrogen it makes some assumptions about investment from Westminster and it also makes some yeah. assumptions about projects that we're currently waiting for like the electrification of the Calder Valley line um, it also says we need a 2000 percent increase in cycling which sounds like a big number but if anyone's seen the increase on the streets over the last year, which um, metrics tell me are about 80 to 90 percent, um, it's not not doable. Um, it is doable. It just is going to take some culture change and a bit of a change in how people do things. And I think in terms of our three corporate priorities, developing that really strong sense of place and identity that already exists, um, helping pop ups that have come that have popped up throughout COVID to to keep that local enterprise rich and strong is, is all part and parcel of it. So basically we, we decided to not reinvent the wheel. So we asked Element to do our own granular emission reduction pathwork and the results have just been published. Um, it's come through um, corporate leadership team. It was um, given to leaders brief in the other day and I think it's about to be properly and formally released as part of our climate emergency front page. Um, there is some difficult stuff in there. It's going to take a lot of will cross party, um, but I think that's fine. I think we're all on the same page with this. I know Councillor Dickinson is now um, doing the sort of shadow climate emergency work, um, and I really welcome sort of collaborating with you on that as part of the Climate Change Working Party and beyond. Um, I think there are other elements as well. Um, we have, we, it won't have escaped any of your minds that we set aside a million pounds in the budget specifically for climate emergency work. Now, half of that was kept in house um, and some of that has already been used um, for the public sector decarbonisation project, which is about putting air source, ground source heat pumps in a lot of our um, public buildings um, like Todmorden Library, um, quite a few others I think that you'll probably be aware of. Um, and But more excitingly, the other half has been centred on community projects. Now we do have Community Foundation for Calderdale on board who are going to match fund that half a million pounds. Um, we've already done quite a lot of consultation with the voluntary community sector and they're really excited about the opportunities for what can be done. There is some flexibility with capital and revenue spend so I think that's going to be really exciting for what people can deliver. So far we've had back things about um, community growing projects, um, education for school children, um, retrofitting um, houses and community buildings and asset transfers, um, as well as things like hydro energy um, and, and, and doing um, aquaponics and various different things. So it'd be really good to see that. That's going to be formally launched in about two or three weeks. Um, I think what's, I, I, think, I think the main critical thing is obviously Calderdale's attracted quite a lot of capital funding. Um, through the high streets money, through the town boards money. Um, we've got projects going on in Halifax, the Halifax Station Gateway, the Ellen Station Gateway, the, the new bus station and, and the leisure centre. I think it's really important that we all recognise how important it is to make sure that those buildings are sustainable, are as future proof as they can be. 
I know they're going through quite a lot of layers of, of scrutiny at the moment, and Wicker is certainly scrutinising their own capital projects with a view on air quality, with a view on the climate emergency and, and what it means for the future. So um, there's quite a lot of stuff happening. Um, I think our priorities, though, at the moment is making sure that we deliver the emission reduction pathway properly, that you guys all understand what it means and that we let it um, help us develop a proper action plan for getting there. We know what needs to be done. Um, it's more broad, though, in terms of the whole of Collardale, and there is stuff we need to do to take that leadership role, but we equally need our partners. We need our leaders to all be on board in delivering some of that change that we need to see. Um, we are in a bit of a refresh and a rebrand of the Climate Emergency webpage. Um, it's been really functional and good so far but um, we're going to use some of that really strong branding that you may well have seen on some of our electric vehicles pootling around um, the net zero um, Calderdale um, sort of branding um, to really underpin what that means and to really make sure that we use that whenever we're doing projects in and around the borough, like our school streets, um, like the play streets that we hope to finally get working now that COVID restrictions are easing um, and any of these projects that you think might well um, feed into some of that. So we want to continue working with the Youth Council. who have been really, really good and strong partners in everything. We want to continue working with you guys and we want to really reach all of those places that we have and, and reaching our businesses, I think, is the real priority for the year. They're the sort of one peer group that we need to engage that little bit more because I think everyone is on board. I think people just need to understand how and where to get there and that's where we come in. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or pick up anything else. I hope that was okay. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Very good. Very, very, very comprehensive. I mean, I thought one of the challenges is you said keeping businesses on board, but what about the public generally? Is there some kind of education campaign for them as well, or informative campaign rather than lecturing campaign, as it were? No, I think you. I think you're dead right, and I think we need yeah. to leave. I think we need to leave our assumptions at the door, don't we, that people broadly get climate change because yes. I don't necessarily think that's the key. So I think it's going to be really key in this coming year to adapt our language for those different places. Councillor Lynn mentioned North Halifax yeah. as a focus earlier, and I think that's a that's a real focus area that we need to crack. When people's when people's actually concerns are about getting that next meal on the table, aren't they? Or you know. Yeah. Um, how, how to get the kids to school or what, what what work means for them. So no, you're you're right. I think that's a that's a real uh, strong area that needs more focus. Yeah, I mean, volunteers are always better than conscripts, aren't they? I mean, it, it's just <laughs> back to your point of word. Anyway, thanks for that, Scott. It's very very good. Um, yeah. Anybody got more questions, please? Or anyone want to comment? Paul, is that you, Paul Benninger? So you seem a long way off. I don't know why you're so far from your screen. Are you? oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to do the sleep. <laughs> Trying to hide away my glowing face from the sun. Right. Um, it, a similar question, really, that I put to, to Zora, and that's how you identify the areas, Scott, that actually need improvements uh, for air quality. I will always um, support my ward because I know we, we, we've really not had any air quality management assessments done in, in Greenland and Stale. And it's an area which you know, the main road runs through at a very low level and with two schools on those road sides as well. So, you know, I, I'd like to get a bit more of an understanding on how you identify which areas you think are going to be more of a priority than, than others. Well, no, that's, yeah, can I answer that? Um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah th 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 thank cool. you. Thank you, Councillor Bellinger. I mean, no, you, you're dead right. You're dead right. And I think what's really important going forward is I asked last year at the tail end of last year to refresh what the air quality management group looks like um, I think it's I think it's run well in the past but I think it can, can always do better and I think we, we, we're due to meet I think in the next month or so with this new governance in place which is about splitting it in two into sort of operational and strategic and I think that'll really give us the opportunity um, we, we, <laughs> For those that aren't aware, we did lose one of our main air quality um, officers, Tommy Morehouse, who left the authority last year. And for anyone that knew Tommy, he was an absolute work for, you know, he was a force of nature, he really knew his stuff. He was a, a real geek about it all and understood the technical nature of things. Um, so, but what he was doing at the time was he was doing quite a lot of strategic and operational work at the same time. And I think we need to 
make sure going forward that we're looking at them as separate pieces of work so that we're not muddling up where people are got people are doing um so you're right i mean i think we definitely need to you know cast a fresh pair of eyes over all of our aqmas make sure they're still fit for purpose there's been a lot of difficulty in monitoring throughout covid because of all the different variables in terms of transport use and how that's peaked and gone down again how people have been working from home but i think as things start to ease back on we can start to do some proper monitoring which will give us some decent data some workable data that doesn't feel like a glitch um, and more than happy to speak to you about specific places on the side i think you're right about monitoring because doing something while covid's on is different to, to normal circumstances so we need a period of stability really to do some monitoring don't we because everything's yeah. i mean you know six months ago there weren't any cars on the road now we're back to where we started so it's difficult to make judgments and, and come to conclusions over that exactly chair yeah 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 thank you any... i appreciate that yeah thank you thank you Bob. rosanna are you trying to indicate sorry your, your speech seems small for some reason i don't know why it must be the ipad uh thanks chair yeah i can, see, I can just see the top of your head Oh, you know, I can see now. I can see all of you now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I've just got two comments, or I don't know if the questions or comments. So the point about we're in a new norm. Um, so obviously, lots of people have ended up working from home, and even though we are seeing cars back on the streets, mm. I think for some groups of people, there's this rush to go back to nor norm normal as in meaning the old normal and actually we need to accept that we're not you know and, and that exists we've, we've had that discussion amongst counsellors around face-to-face -face meetings or zooms and that same conversation is probably taking place in every office and I'm just wondering what the council's role is in terms of facilitating that uh, an almost permanent culture change around saying well some things will go back to the way they were but some things need to change particularly in relation to climate change because what we don't want is lots of businesses around Calderdale, you know, big businesses, I'm thinking, like, that have got huge offices, really trying to kind of force their employees to get back as soon as possible when we've seen all these amazing changes. So I suppose the question is, what is our role in terms of facilitating that culture change? And then my second point is just around, so it's brilliant that you're giving all this funding for community groups. I'm just wondering, are we building in some kind of reflective practice around that? Because there'll be some groups that will face challenges and it won't work. And it'd be really useful to learn from that. And I'm thinking in particular, there's loads of analysis around why certain groups, for example, won't cycle. So if you take traditionally, you've got two people and one is the primary carer of children. Usually, traditionally, that would have been a woman who, instead of just going to work, drops the kids off at school, goes to work on a lunch hour, goes to get shopping, gets back. There's, there's so much analysis around the fact that why it's very difficult for a woman in that situation to, they don't do an A plus B journey. They do lots of different journeys in a day. And then there's other groups that might not know how to cycle or can't afford bikes. So there's just so much analysis around why certain groups won't get on a bike or get into active travel. So it'd just be really useful to build some of that reflective practice into which I'm sure you've already done, Councillor Patient, but just to comment on <laughs> what reflective practice are we thinking about so we can learn going forward, this this is not work for this group in park for this reason, therefore we're going to put this solution in place. Okay, okay. thank That's you. So, yeah, no, you nice and easy questions of Councillor Kavanagh. Um, so, I mean, in terms, of the, in terms of the first piece of work about the new normal, I think you're dead right, and there's a lot of complexities. I was speaking with you or someone else about this the other day, and in terms of what it means for people that choose not to go back to work and how they're actually disproportionately affected by perhaps not getting that first bite of the apple to climb the corporate ladder, or they're not there to have those sort of on-the-side discussions. And I think, I think as we come out of COVID, there's going to be some really delicate learning. I mean, the people that probably do choose to stay at home might be more likely to be women um, with their young children. So that's what sort of widening that, you know, inequalities gap there. So I think we do definitely need to take a leading role. I don't know what that looks like at the moment, um, but I think we need to develop that. So that's a really good point in terms of what our stewardship needs to look like. I definitely think some of it's been taken into account through the work that Sean and co have been doing on the recovery board. Um, and that group and I think that's perhaps something we can sort of feed in there and see if we can get some synergy 
working in terms of that but I, I, I'm, I, I can't I can't do exact um, total recall on what's been done in that that piece of work may have been properly done or it may maybe in development or it may may need kickstarting through me sending an email but um, I'll, I'll certainly let you know in terms of what's what's going on on that um, in terms of the reflective practice so I mean I think partnering with CFFC is a good thing because that's something they do and they bake in already to their um, to their grant applications. They that they're, they're quite thorough. They initially tend to do um, a survey monkey analysis in terms of what's happening where, what people are asking for, and they put it through various metrics in terms of geography, in terms of social deprivation, in terms of what might be missing, in terms of you know um, uh, various different profiling, um, but. I think as well, um, I mean, I sit on a couple of the boards that have been throughout COVID giving out money through the holiday hunger money and they're very, very thorough in, in, in how they manage and measure that. It goes through a board and a panel of about nine or 10 people. They all have to have a good and thorough look at it and leave their comments. Um, there are comments given by the major funder who works for CFFC, um, but it's a very equitable way that they do it. Um, I do think what I've, from what I've seen already in terms of the people that have already engaged with the sort of pre-fund survey monkey is that they've got a wider understanding of what's happening where and what needs doing. Um, they've also engaged with um, the with VAC um, and with Sean and other people so they understand the needs and wants in particular areas. So I think that reflect reflective practice works. Um, I, I, can, I can't tell you the exact details of it, um, but, I, but I know that it's there and it's something CFFC certainly pride themselves on. And I think it's something that Calderdale themselves would insist on as well. Thank you, Scott. Have I frozen? You have now, but I could hear I'm you. I'm assuming but... it's me. Yeah, yeah. You, you throw, well, you Was it me? Well. Yeah, well, you're not, you're not, you know, you're moving now. <laughs> did, did, did I, did I finish my rant? Did I finish yeah, my yeah, rant? Yeah, we can hear what you were saying. We just, we just look like a robot, you know. <laughs> I've been called worse. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Thanks very much, anyway. All right. Um, any more questions for Scott, please, for anybody? Regan. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was more of an observation, really, that uh, part of the problem that we have as a, as a council and as a, as a, as a um, combined authority Going forward is the, um, for example, with the uh, um, future of housing, um, we're, we're hamstrung by the limitations of national policy. And it would be just wonderful if we had a lot more local autonomy in areas like that, where we could achieve optimum and absolute best practice in terms of uh, energy conservation and use in uh, the design and implementation of, of housing, just as one just as one simple example, bearing in mind that some, I can't remember what the proportions are, but of uh, the carbon footprint of um, of homes is it's more like forty percent, Scott? Is it as much as that? Maybe less. Yeah, than, Maybe, yeah slightly. Um, and it would be it'd be it would be wonderful to have that a lot more autonomy in the absence of a more, uh, shall we say, uh, concentrated approach from, uh, from 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 national government. And I, I suspect that uh, it almost doesn't matter what stripe the government is, um, they're going to be taking small footsteps where where bigger ones, I think, uh, are required. No, I think you're right, but I do think there's, I, I do think perhaps opportunities locally to, um, it's again, it's difficult. And like you said, there are policy gaps there that makes the financial stacking up of housing um, situations difficult. Um, there's definitely not just a role in building new houses. There's, a, there's, there's something to be done in terms of deep energy retrofit. And I think we need to take every opportunity to make that happen whether it's rapping on the mayor's door or, or whether it's you know lobbying to number 10 or working with our housing providers as well um to make sure that happens i'd really like to just um give give um uh, calder valley community land trust a shout out because actually they're a real good example of an innovative housing provider who are actually trying to do some different things who are thinking outside the box who are doing some more smaller scale developments but with a real eye on sustainability, they want they want to be the first group to actually build a ha you know a passive house um, community in and around Calderdale. And I think we really need to support our not not just our great bigger housing providers like Together Housing, but also our more smaller ones to achieve some of that. Um, and I think there are ways and means. It's just taking the opportunities as they as they fall on us and making sure that the learning is there, the understanding and the skills to deliver as well within Calderdale. 
Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Does that address your question, Regan? Well, yeah, as I say, it was more of an observation, really. But if you get people yeah. taking it on by themselves, so, for example, to develop passive housing and uh, minimising the carbon requirement for, um, for, for heating, um, whether it's for cooking or for, for, for space heating, that's got to be encouraged. You know, it's um, and yeah, set up as um, best practice uh, going forward. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, can put my, I can get behind. I don't see anybody, I don't see anybody else signalling, so... Okay. Paul, sorry, I didn't see you. You're, you're distant again. I can see you now. You're yeah, right. Sorry, sorry, Jay. I'll try and bring myself yeah. a little bit closer. Yeah. yeah, it's just something I come up with. Uh, I think it's something that Roisin's made me think about, actually, and that's with, you know, the various groups of people uh, that, that, that cycle, those that have probably never done it for years and those that are doing it regular. I think one of the one of the, the problems we have in Calderdale, and that's the topography, um, you know, the northern side and the southern side, it, it, it gets quite steep which tends to put a lot of people off cycling to, to work, you know, those commuting routes. What sort of things do you envisage putting into place to, to overcome those challenges, Scott? Because it'd be nice to get as many people as possible out of the cars and cycling to work, but obviously it's difficult to get those people to, to cycle when they've got a, a steep hill to climb either on the way to work or on the way home. Probably. No, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, yeah, you're preaching to the choir. It's not, a, you know, there are days throughout the year when I, you know, look at my bike and think, oh, gosh, do I really have to? Um, so, no, you're right. I mean, I think there are obstacles in place, aren't there? Even if a seasoned cyclist is sort of having some of those thoughts. Some of it's around, some of it's around in putting infrastructure in place for e-bikes. E e um, you know, e-bikes are coming down in price all the time. They're coming down in weight all the time, and the and the take up has been absolutely phenomenal. Although you know that there, I mean, going up a hill is absolutely a doddle on an e bike. There is sort of a bit of charging limitation, but I don't think you know that much. But I think what we need to do is normalise it, is to try and rethink how we're using our roads to actually remind people that the roads aren't just for cars; they are for people on motorcycles, they are for cyclists as well. And really, that's going to need a culture change. Um, and it's for us to drive that culture change in terms of how these spaces should be used. And, you know, I mean, if, if, even my wife is slightly disparaging about cyclists when you're stuck behind one, you know, on a on a country road. And, and, and there will always, be, I think, be conflicts like that. There are more cyclists using the canal path now. So there's, there's that conflict with pedestrians. And I think you sort of have to get over those. They do sort of right themselves given time. But I do think, yeah, you're right. It's it's not going to be something we manage overnight. And I do think we need a really robust transport plan to help sort some of that out. We are working on, a, on one of those at the moment. We need a really robust e-charging infrastructure, and that's for cars. But it's also for bikes attached to those, thinking of them as sort of mini, mini mobility hubs. Um, and I think we just need to look at what's happening around the UK, look at best practice, but also think about, wow, we are quite unique topographically. We have got very, very steep hills and that needs sorting out so I think it's taking a means tested view about how people are traveling making sure we've got that data making sure we've got the Strava data as well as sort of more broad data and and I, yeah I mean it, it needs it needs some broad thinking um, and I, I guess that's I, I'd invite you and others to come to the climate change working party and try and answer some of these knottier questions and see if we can do anything or bring any investment in in terms of that. Thank you, Scott. I've got Jenny Lynn and Steph Clark, and then I'm going to call it a day if possible. Right, just a very quick comment about buses. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> hopefully, we've got the um, we've got the mayor coming to Calderdale before to, the mayor of West Yorkshire coming to Calderdale before too long, and I know she's interested in really challenging the status quo as far as buses are concerned. Because one of the things I'm very conscious of is that bus travel is is it's it's well used among some communities, but it's very flipping expensive, really. Um, but on the other hand, um, I mean, I had an example. I went a couple of days ago. I went to see a friend of mine who's in the hospice at, at, in Overgate Hospice, um, and I rang up and, and booked, and, and she said, "Oh, she said, do you know the way here?" I said, "Well, actually, I'm going to come on the bus." And it was only after I said it, I thought, "Yeah, okay. So which bus is it?" And it's a five or three, and it was fine. And I got off where I had to get off, and all the rest of it. It was really easy. Ten minute service. Why wouldn't you? Um, so for me, there's also something, going back to the point about education, there's also something about just getting us all to think 
think walking, cycling, public transport first, and then you, you take the car if you have to take the car. But not the first thing you do is you think about the car. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. No, that's fine. That, that, that makes sense, you know, that, that your car's your last option rather than your first option. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, that's, that's not a bad policy, actually, really. Um, Seth Clark. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, yeah. I must say I'm not cycling from the town hall to three and a half mile uphill. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not at my age. <laughs> uh, that's not why I'm speaking anyway. Um, we, I think we've got to sort of reduce it as well to sort of everyday life. Um, a, a little while ago, just before the election, I had a, an email from um, a lady who was promoting nappies, cloth nappies. Um, and uh, because I think one of the biggest polluters is uh, are all the all the disposable nappies. Um, so I think I think we need to get some people to change their minds about how how what type of nappies they use. They reckon that they use about four thousand nappies per child. It's four thousand bits of nappy going into reuse into into landfill or wherever they go. I don't know if some of them are reusable now recyclable but i think i think we have to get it down to that sort of level it's not just about buses and cycling it's not just about transport that is spoiling the climate agree yeah i agree i think there's a lot too much disposable stuff isn't there i mean nappies not only are just completely wasted after one go they're yeah. just uh, block sewers and toilets and all sorts of things and, and drains as well so you're quite right about that yeah scott sorry Oh, sorry, was it Guy waving? Yeah, just a quick one. Yeah. Of course, uh, modern nappies these days, you know, with all the, whatever they are, the elasticated waste and everything else, you can actually buy washable ones now that go, that go in the washing machine and can be reused. I know this because my youngest daughter uses them. That's, uh, thought I'd mention that. Well, thanks for that advert. On that note... <laughs> That's what I used when I had my children. <laughs> See, so things are, things are going back to normal. Um, but anyhow, thanks to everyone for that. Thanks, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Jenny, out there, and everybody else for that matter. Um, so, if we call that one a day, and we'll now move on to where we were a minute ago. And I'm sorry about that, Scott. I don't know why. I just because you were mentioned in the first presentation, but not actually any further slides. I just got to the end of prematurely. My apologies. No worries. Um, Right, uh, go back to, are we all right in green spaces now? Are you doing this, Lauren? I think I'm bloody oh, confused. Regan presenting it. it. Is, is it Regan? Yeah, it's you group, yeah. Regan, are you still there? You're on, you're on the floor, Regan. Well, not literally, but... You... Right, okay, well, I will be shortly. Um, yeah, just to reiterate the introduction, actually, it was, it was a fascinating piece of work to be involved in. Um, 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 and um, we could have done a lot more, a lot more talking. And by the end of the first uh, scrutiny in a day, there were some really, um, uh, how would I describe it, um, politely uh, annoyed that they'd been sat there for three or four hours and still hadn't had a chance to be asked questions and what have you. But it was, it was absolutely absorbing. And as as um, as Councillor Lynn pointed out at the time, it wasn't really an exercise in trying to find out what Colderdale were doing wrong, because so much of what we do is already pretty good. Um, but to, to augment perhaps further what we could be doing, um, and uh, the the take home messages that I was coming up with were, you know, in terms of the communication, really more than anything else, in terms of allowing people to. Um, to become involved that the barriers to entry to becoming a friends of for example group were were reduced to make it a lot more accessible for folks to be who are community oriented um to, to become a lot more involved and perhaps even to inspire people to become community oriented too and, and, and get involved in in those green spaces that we are we are lucky to still have um the um the recommendations there are are, are fairly succinct um and really, I'm going to keep it pretty short, um, is that we would welcome further feedback and discussion on that. You see if there's anything that we can bring to, to, to uh, augment our, our report um, uh, to, to, before we present it to Cabinet for uh, their, their, their consideration. Uh, so uh, yeah, over to the floor. Uh, but yeah, before I do though, um, 
big up to Lauren and Mike in terms of uh, the actual writing down bit of uh, what was quite often a disjointed and um, broad ranging holistic approach to 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 the to the issues. Uh, how they've managed to condense it down into what they have done is is, is impressive. So uh, yeah, I would like to recognise um, at this meeting the, that that work that was done by them to produce uh, to get this together. So uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. I mean, I, I, it has. I mean, I was at a lot of the meetings, and how you put took notes and did minutes and put it together like this, I don't know. It must be difficult, but you, you seem to have got it in a you know a good condensed form. Um, I'm going to open it to the floor, but I'm just looking at the recommendations. Is there anything in there particularly, Regan? That I mean, I'm not all recommendations, but is there anything? Have you got any priorities in there? Um, let me just scan down to them as well, just to refresh myself very, very quickly. Um, page, uh, yeah, I think there is, no, uh, no page numbers. Um, slide two, I think it is. Oh, much yeah. further up. No, oh, sorry, I've lost it now. I've had it and I lost it. Can't believe it. Anyway, the recommendations generally. Oh, here we are. Uh, it certainly needs to define the was between the council. Yeah, um, yes, it was that. It, that emphasis on defining roles, responsibility, um, communi yeah, communication packet. Pack yeah, for me, the, the big thing for me really was uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the communication um, to, to allow people to access uh, clearly and easily um, how, how they can get involved in that re regard. Because um, what, one, one impression that I picked up more than anything else was that it was a little bit of a struggle in and of itself to establish not just to establish a group, but to get it recognised and get that uh, cooperation with 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 the council uh, in in a in a more well, it's not insuperable because they, they clearly are, are there and, and they do and they are thriving. But uh, in, in terms of making it easier and more seamless to allow to reduce the barriers, as it were, to entry, um, that yeah, um, that that was yeah. I mean, I, I know it's number three, but. It does tie in, for example, with with the, uh, the roles and responsibility of number one, um, and yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's. I know. It, so I'm not asking you to. I'm not asking you to prioritise them. I'm just. No, it's it was. Just, yeah, some it's, of them have stronger messages than others. That's all. Yeah, it's. It, yeah, it's. There's seven recommendations there, and, and they are they are all valid and strong points that, that, that could be made um, and it to be taken in the round in some regards really um, and, and th yeah, that both can be taken individually and collectively to 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 in improve that aspect of the green spaces and um, um, and its and its management going forward no right, okay thanks Regan anybody got any comments on this paper it's quite a I mean I, I was just coming I mean I, I think given we have an aging population and I mean there are a lot, a lot of volunteers now out there who are willing to do it. And I, I, part, part of my comment during this was, we are, the council needs to make it as easy as possible for volunteers to do things rather than throwing hurdles up. And I think, I think that's becoming more the case um, because we, I'm not saying we're operating a slave trade here, but people actually like to volunteer to get out and do things. And the more, the easier the council makes to available, it helps us both because we're short of resources and we've got willing workers. So we might as well make, make the two work for us. So that, I think that's recommendation four. Anybody else got any uh, comments? Jenny? Uh, yeah, well, I just really like, I, I think they, the panel would really benefit from hearing from, uh, from Jonathan Cole and, and possibly yeah. from Andrew who, who run the service because there's some fantastic work going on. There's some really good work going on in terms of engaging with with volunteers and so on, um, and not not all volunteers actually do come through the council, but there's, there is a there is a sort of structure in place to support volunteers, and it'd be great. I think I would suggest, Chair, that I'm sure Jonathan or Andrew would be willing to just say a little bit more about what yeah, what's yeah. happening now and how they perhaps re react to, to the recommendations that you've made, which I think are very good. Yeah, Thank Jonathan, you are you are you, are you there? Oh, I can see you, I think. Yeah, I can see I'm you. here. I'm here. I think they can hear me a lot. Yeah. I can, hear, I can hear you fine, yes, Councillor. Yeah, all right. Okay. Then you're to call um, Yeah. One of the things that we've done around volunteers is um, a few years ago, um, Amanda Firth, who was, who was a predecessor in the SCG service, um, appointed a volunteer coordinator. Um, unfortunately, the funding for this role is a only for we get it managed to get funding agreed for every 12 months and then we have to find some more from somewhere else 
So for the last 12, well, the current 12 months, we managed to find some funding through Active Coldale for that role. Um, and the new lady that we've got doing this role is has made it, she's taken what was a very complicated process for people to help the council and made it a really simple way of doing it now. Um, I know she did some work with um, uh, Council Dunger in the same ward um, and she's got this process really down to a really simple way of a real simple risk assessment, something that's really understandable to do. Uh, and she's got such a passion about the whole thing that um, we're making some massive leaps and bounds. Um, and I think, I can't remember the exact figures, but they, for last year, it was a shocking amount of hours that was uh, were, uh, people volunteered. Mm. Unfortunately, as a service, it's quite hard when we've got a role that's not part of our structure and we have to try to go beg borrowing for funding for their wages uh, year on year. Uh, and it's quite uncertain for the member of staff as well, obviously, because, you know, most people like to have a permanent job, not something that maybe will carry on after that period of time. Um, so that's an area where I'm not sure how we're going to do it, because obviously times are very tight. But it's an area where I think we really need to make this into a permanent role, because the value this officer brings back in is 10, 20, 30, 40 times more than the, what it would cost us for the salary to employ them. Um, and but it's also the fact that and I know um, she went to an event that Council Bellinger held in at the park in um, Stainland and there was a massive group of residents from elderly right through to sort of families with children doing litter picks and stuff and it's having a massive effect on that park it's taking what we can maintain at a basic level and bring it up to a massive a, a wonderful standard um, so that would be my ask is that you know we sometimes somehow find a way that we can actually make this post a, full, a permanent full-time post that carries on doing this, delivering what is a really critical service in these ongoing hard times. Uh, I'm not sure if Andrew wants to add anything else. Andrew? Ah, Andrew, you appeared. Do you want to add anything to that, Andrew? Um, yes, I'll just, just a, a couple of things, Chair. Um, I mean, I think what emerged out of the, the, the discussions, which, as you say, were, were very comprehensive and, 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 and wide ranging, was this issue that is not unique to this service, that I think applies across many, if not all, council service areas, that we need to develop our partnership with communities. And when I say communities, I, I, I sort of include individuals, people who want to be members of sort of casual, more informal groups, and people who want to be part of formal constituted groups that have meetings where people take minutes and get elected as chair and they put together bids for funding and whatever. So it's about, it's about maximising the use of the collective resources that we've got in the district. Um, and I think there are probably three sort of key things that flow from that, which I think the report captures very well. The first one is about, in using these collective resources, we need to be very clear about who does what. There are some things that, to be blunt, communities will never be able to do because there's only the council as the necessary, um, you know, it could be technical ex expertise or access to the, you know, the particular machinery or equipment or, or whatever. So there are some things that we will always do as a council, but there are many other things that people can work with us to enhance, you know, the quality of life in, in, in local neighbourhoods and town centres. And I'll return to town centres in a moment. Um, it's about really making sure that local people are working with us, not for us, because I'm also acutely aware of this issue that, you know, people pay their council tax and they pay other forms of taxation and Part of that is um, that they get public service delivery in return. What we will always do is we will provide to the best of our, our ability a basic level of service, which you know I think will be, when I say basic, I don't mean that is in, in, in bargain basement type stuff. I mean, you know, a quality level of service across the whole district. And to refer to the point I think Councillor Bellinger made right at the start of the meeting about, you know, not forgetting uh, different different communities and all that sort of thing is these are universal services uh, but we, we we always tweak the way that we deliver them to reflect sort of local circumstances it may be you know what's appropriate in an area in I don't know say park ward with a lot of takeaways and all that sort of thing might not be necessary in more rural areas so 
it's a universal service but tailored um, to local local need. But it is about making sure that we have that true partnership. People don't feel that, you know, the council is basically making them do something that the council should be doing in the first place. Let's all play to our strengths, to use that uh, sporting analogy, if you like. Um, and the thing that I won't dwell on, and I know, Chair, that you're very keen on this and we've had discussions about it. And to me, it's an absolute, you know, no brain, really. We have got to make it easy for people. We have got to get away from that unfortunate public sector um, um, predisposition to always put obstacles in people's ways. We've got to, you know, we've got to um, um, release people to, to, to work with us. So all those sort of things about, you know, things like making equipment available, making sure that people have information they can, um, they know how to, to work with us, um, you know, supporting networks and communication and all that sort of thing. So that, that's the first bit. The second thing, though, which Jonathan's talked about, so I'm not going to dwell on this, is we've got to be able to sustain that. And we need resources to do that. You know, I mean, there are other people um, in, the, in the meeting who know more about this, but, you know, volunteers need investment. You know, it is not just about getting a bunch of people together and, you know, and, 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 and setting them off and, and just leaving them. You know, we do need that work that um, our volunteer coordinator has has started to build those networks, to put in place that support and ensure that that sort of relationship that I've talked about is, is sustainable. And the last piece of learning that I think um, I'd say from an officer point of view is, and again, this is, uh, I think, timely given that Council of Patients has, has talked about, you know, the climate emergency, is that parks and open spaces contribute to a lot of other agendas you know, the, the active Calderdale agenda, which is mentioned in the in the recommendations explicitly, but also issues around climate change, biodiversity, and even things like, you know, addressing social isolation, getting people together in voluntary groups or linking people up with allotments or whatever, you know, it can help them be active, it can help them maintain um, social relationships that are better for their, you know, wider well-being. So, so th th there's, there's a lot here. And just quickly to finish, I think in terms of what happens next, the report refers to town centres, and I think it would be great for us to start having a look, um, you know, at how we go about maintaining the public realm. Maybe using some of these principles that we've teased out in the more the, the green, green spaces and open spaces um, area. And when I say town centres, I reassure Councillor Bellinger, for example, that I include West Vale and places like that in, in there. I mean town centres and, and, you know, the larger sort of, of areas that we've got in the borough. So I, I, I welcome the opportunity for us to, to move on to do that. And, and Jonathan and I and other staff are already talking about, you know, how we can make improvements in that going forward. And just one final thing, I think practically how I would like to take this forward is we are working with Active Calderdale at the moment on a pilot for a parks and open spaces strategy covering the very loosely the North Halifax area. It's the area running up the A629 from Lee Mount out to the, um, the borough boundary. And this is about um, building on, on, on the principles in the review to make our parks and open spaces attractive, accessible, safe and sustainable. And I don't think anybody would disagree with those as aspirations. Um, uh, as always, a lot of the devil's in the detail and that's why we need a strategy and some you know, clear actions in there. But, but what we will do is we'll use the principles of this review to make sure that we co-produce the improvements that we identify as necessary. It's not about Andrew Pitts deciding, you know, how Beechwood Park should be improved. It's about working with the friends of Beechwood Park and other members of the community to decide what are the real priorities that we can do there. And it's also about collaborating in delivering those improvements. Because going back to my first point, there's some things that we can do it'll be Jonathan who will arrange for you know re-tarmacking to be done we're not having local communities get involved in re-tarmacking paths but yeah. in terms of you know, maintaining the park and, and and other aspects of the improvements that's something that is probably more suited to, to getting local people um, involved so sorry I've gone on a bit uh, uh, yeah. uh, length chair but um, it is uh, it is something that I think has been really um, helpful you know, certainly for me, and I'm sure Jonathan will, will echo that to, um, 
you know, to have gone through this process. So I just wanted to reassure you that this is not going to be one of these pieces of work where, oh, it's great, we get a report. And, and I must echo, I think, Lauren, you've done a fantastic job in pulling all, all this together. It's not going to be one of these where it goes in the pr proverbial, well, it used to be the, the desk drawer, didn't it? But we don't have that now. The, the virtual desk drawer, if you like, to be forgotten about. We will use it, we'll build on it, and it will help to improve our, our services to the public. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. If 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 Zora still here, perhaps we could collectively bully her into giving some more resource for a volunteer coordinator. But that might be a bit unfair, mate. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, I know you're pretty passionate about this 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 particular report. So um, I think actually we were all quite. What's the word? I don't know. We, we all seem to sort of be really encouraged about doing this sort of thing because it affects everybody, doesn't it? It's something to get your teeth into. And I think having the public there was, was great as well. I, I, you know, actual people that run groups because you, you went, you said something about having committees earlier on, which form committees, but a lot of people who do these things like to have ownership of doing it as well. Uh, you know, in, in their, own, might be their own little circles, but they still like to have ownership of it. So it, it does help if we can have this coordinated to get groups together to, to work as coordinated groups. Sorry, Regan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, the, the last point, really, I wanted to make um, is um, at a time when uh, the complaint is often there that uh, there is a uh, loss in the sense of community that people have. This is an opportunity for that uh, for, for engagement um, across a broader front. Um, I think it's something, yeah, that we could anything that we can do to encourage that sense of community and ownership that people have in, in where they live. Uh, there are, you know, this this could it could be just the start of of a, a thin end of a, of a wedge because, you know, you go for the community litter picks. What Paul's did is amazing. Um, up in up in standing, getting that many people involved. But uh, quite often it's the same faces when you do a local one. If we can get people more engaged and get a, that wider sense of community, that can only be a good thing as well. And I think this could be a step in the right direction. But, yeah, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Is everybody okay with the recommendations? Nothing controversial in there, really, is there? Um, is this going to recommend it to cabinet for just for approval, Lauren? Is that the idea? Because we're, yeah. going to have we're going to carry on with this report, aren't we, for phase two, as it were? Uh, yeah. It so I think just before we, we do that, I think Council yeah. Kavanagh and Council Bellinger want to come in. But yeah, just to say that the process would be that this this report goes to cabinet um, yeah. if members are happy, and also that the second part of the work that would be picked up by this board and um, that's sort of covered under recommendation seven. Sorry, uh, Rosie, I didn't see you waving. Have you been waving? No, I put it in the chat chair because I don't, I'm oh, not sure that. which mechanism you want to use. You want us <laughs> to just wave madly. Hey, I can't multitask, you know. <laughs> oh, very away. Sorry. It's all right. Um, I've just got a few comments. Um, so the, I think the report's great. So thank you for that piece of work, everyone that was involved. Um, it's really interesting. Um, it'd be really, I, I actually think we need to do more work on this because it's just so important for Calderdale and it'd be really interesting to see analysis on why some groups manage to work and some don't I mean some of it's really obvious so if you're in the upper valley and you've got lots of retired people who've got no money worries and no health issues it's very easy for them to facilitate you know a volunteer group and they've got lots of capacity and it can be sustainable versus maybe a group of people that are in a more deprived community and the issues that they might face and with for example, Incredible Edible wouldn't mind me saying that, you know, they, their, their slogan is ask for forgiveness, not permission. But there's lots of groups around Calderdale that would not dare to do that. So that that instantly takes, you know, a certain amount of confidence to do some community action without going through, you know, lots of, um, I suppose, getting permission for lots of things. And then the second thing is something we, I think, spoke about with Andrew around how do we make our communities proud? So if you're living in an area that is described by the council and others as deprived, you probably don't describe it yourself as deprived. You don't describe yourself as, I'm living in a deprived community. So we're telling certain stories about communities and how do we change that story to enable people to start to feel proud of where they live? Because there's a reciprocal arrangement, you know, relationship between people be feeling proud, doing litter picking, planting wildflowers, because you feel proud of that place. If, if you're constantly described as, oh, that's a really rough place, there's loads of crime, it's really deprived, you're less likely to be able to take action. So there's something around the narratives we tell. And yeah. then, Andrew, I'm really happy about the thing you said about making things easier because 
when we've got trusted community groups, it takes stuff on. As soon as there's something little that's difficult, it can really throw them back. So an example is, you know, I've been working on a piece of land, um, clearing a piece of land during lockdown. And we're going, there's a group of us that are going for a community growing license. Um, and I remember speaking to a neighbourhood warden and saying, oh, since we've cleared it of brambles, now there's older people walking through it and it's really peaceful and people are walking their dogs. But someone said they wanted a bench to sit on. And when I spoke to the neighbourhood warden, she said, oh, but who will maintain it? You know, if, and, and instantly the, the group that I was with was like, well, do we have the capacity to maintain a bench going forward? <laughs> it's a really silly example, but it's things like that that start to put people, start to like put the fear in people because you think, well, wait a minute, we just wanted a bench for an older person to sit on as they went for a walk. But there's that kind of who does what thing. Um, and my last point I'll finish is we need to invest to save. So a volunteer coordinator saves the council a ridiculous amount of money because of the, the stuff that the volunteers do in communities that the council then doesn't need to do. So I actually agree with the kind of bullying Zora comment, Peter, although it's probably not Zora, so, and I don't want Zora <laughs> bullied. <laughs> But I do, think, I do, think, I do think we need to invest to save um, yeah. going forward. And a volunteer coordinator is a, a really massive... I mean, one volunteer coordinator to do all of that is already not enough, but we, we need a permanent role that is supporting all that work. Thank you. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, I'm quite excited about all this, quite passionate and enthusiastic like we all are. I think this is an amazing piece of work that's actually coming together that will make some huge changes to Coldrail. So yeah, I'm, I'm as pleased as any councillor can be about what's taking place. I can't take all the credit for what happened in Shaw Park, by the way. It was a member of public that's brought a lot of people together. So I am going to mention a name here in this meeting. It's Jackie Floyd. I'm sure she'll be able to mention her name as well. So I cannot take all the credit, but I was there to help and coordinate some of the things as well. Um, uh, Rasheen's just basically mentioned about Amy, the coordinator, the volunteer coordinator. Yes, invest to save. She is saving the authority a lot of money by bringing these groups of volunteers together, saving us a fortune. So, yeah, she would be a huge investment for Calderdale. So I would like to think, really, we can probably make that a recommendation, maybe, that the, uh, the Cabinet actually look at ways of trying to uh, keep this role secure, basically, within the authority. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be something that, uh, Chair, you'd be happy to allow us... Well, I'm happy with it, yeah. I mean, Andrew, is that plugged enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> You've got quite a lot of support here for a volunteer coordinator. I'm not sure we'll put the pressure on, but we could certainly put it as a recommendation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, sorry, I'm picking on you, Zara. Sorry, I, I, you were just there. But, as I say, I feel, I feel very bullied, Chair, in the nicest <laughs> possible way. Yeah. Thank you and, very much. And, and yeah, Chair, if I, if I, Chair, if I could just come in, I mean, yeah. um, if we look, go back to the recommendations, uh, yeah. recommendation five actually specifically mentions the volunteer coordinator. Yeah. Further clarity is needed around the funding and length of volunteer coordinator. This role is fundamental in continuing to develop the links between community groups and volunteers will be a key part of ruling out the communication programme and establishing network groups. So, I mean, you might decide as a group you want to kind of like strengthen that, but it's certainly in there already in the report, which is yeah, great. Yeah, so. Maybe strengthen it then. Okay. Well, if it's, if it's there, it's, I, I probably didn't see it as that word. Yeah. I think, can I, but, just to finish off with as well, Chair, just add an, an, another little bit. What we have to also do is is, is recognise the hard work that the volunteers put in as well. So at the, at the yeah. end, we've, we've got to at least be able to give them some sort of thank you or maybe make it so there's some sort of an award given to a community group every year for the best kept park or something like that. A letter from the chief yeah. saying thank you. So then at least these people feel valued then for what they're actually putting into Calderdale. We must not forget, you know, what they're doing for us. And they are really helping us out in a big way financially as well. So we must ensure we thank them for it. No, that, that's it. So it's something to take on board. Uh, it's a good point, is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, Councillor yeah. Bellinger, one of the things that Amy would like yeah. to do, if I can get the, the sort of appropriate hours in the week for her, um, we're looking at potentially using some social media type platforms um, as a sort of a way of sort of um, thanking groups for what they do. 
uh, but also sort of to encourage other people to start taking part. Because um, we've just had somebody very recently who, who um, thought it was Christmas when, when one of the lads delivered her a litter picker and some bags. Um, and now every Monday, one of the lads was telling me, by the, the bin where she's been told to leave it, there's a bag every Monday of, of stuff. And he says, the area where she's picking is just amazing. But she didn't expect us to provide the bag. She didn't expect us to provide the litter picker. But the fact she's done that and she's doing such a good job, we're now going to get her, because she was saying she was finding it hard to get the bag. So we've been out and bought, I think for about £10, a little ring that holds the bag open for her. And right. it's the sort of thing that we'd like to be able to promote through social media things and stuff like that. So that we, as you say, promote, but also thank people for the work they're doing. Thank you, Jonathan. Right, everybody's all right. Thanks thanks very much for participating. Um, very important subject, close to all our hearts, I think. And um, let's carry on uh, to the next stage, Lauren. Thank you for your contribution. You worked very hard on that. Right, if everybody's happy, we'll move on to the next item, which is the work plan, I think. Chair. Yeah. Chair. <laughs> Have I missed something again? Fun. I think we've oh, got to vote on the recommendations. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, I thought we'd sort of done that, really. No, we haven't. You're right, OK. Thanks for that, Dave. No, I'm moving. I'm, I'm glad people are there to keep me straight on this one. Um, yeah, sorry, my apologies, a bit of on my part. Yes, is everybody OK with the um, recommendations? We're all right on the um, yeah, yeah. policy coordinator one. The wording's already there, so yes. Yeah. Yes, good point. Dave, I think that's that's passed, don't you? Yes, it is. Yeah, thanks, Dave, for flagging that up. It did, it did need formalising. Um, if we could move on now to um, work plan. Well, I can get it up. Work program. I know Mike's not available. Lauren, uh, have you got any particular guidelines on this, or is it just a case of your email earlier on going through, look at some of the, the stuff that's inherited from previously, see if we still need it? Yeah, so I could, yes, yeah, so I can give you a quick update. Um, I know that yeah. I think yourself and Councillor Cabinet had a meeting um, with Zora and um, yeah. Cabinet members on Monday. So there are yeah. a few items from that that we'll share with members and we'll build right. into the work programme. And if you right. agree, we'll take those forward. Um, right. I'll, I'll speak to Mike about that and we'll get something out early next week to the board if that's okay. Um, yeah. I think the agenda is pretty much set for the August meeting, but obviously if any members have anything they want to change or add on, if you just speak to either myself or Mike or Councillor Caffrey and Councillor Cavanaugh, yeah. we can sort of right now. Um, and then, yeah, as you've just indicated, Chair, there's a few items that's at the end of the table that have been inherited from last year's work programme. Um, I guess it's it's entirely up to members whether or not you want to take those forward or consider them. We can do that outside of the meeting all this evening um, and just sort of get some dates dates next to them. Okay. These are the ones at the end, like crime figure trends. And we have to fit in, don't we? Um, what's the word? Uh, crime. We're two panels, and aren't we? The committee, yeah. You'll have to meet. What's it called? What's it called? Police and Crown Commissioners, something like that. The Crime and Disorder Committee, I think it is. No, that was it. Sorry, yeah, you're right. I couldn't hear you when you break it up. Yeah, we've got to fit that in somewhere. So, um, well, yeah, so the, these the, items the, could form that agenda um, yeah. relating to crime. There's quite, there's quite a lot of uh, stuff on here. Um, devolution is that history now? Do we need that? Um, does everybody need a, a talking on devolution or is everybody aware of what's going on? I'll leave it on if you want, but um, crime figure trends. I'll tell you what we'll do. When we, we, following our discussion the other day, when Mike gets back, I'll, I'll have a look at what we discussed and then we'll look at the back end of this and see what else we get. And then just send an email out or, or we'll, we'll do a, a piece for next scrutiny meeting and get it approved rather than sort of try and do it um, piecemeal like this. Uh, and then we can get other things on as well because we have got a lot on, as I said earlier. Uh, I mean, August is looking pretty long as it is. 
um, which is why I'm, you know we need to focus on things that we have to we have to do rather than try and be all things to all men or women or whatever. Well, I'll have to say these days. So is that all right with everybody? We'll we'll have a review of it with Mike and then um, come back next time or send an email in the meantime. That's fine. Well, you're, you're all on mute, yep, so you don't agree good. with me. Oh, yeah, I can't put my mind up. But, right, okay. Is everybody happy with that approach? Or has anybody got any specific they want to put on now? No. Nope. I like to see happy, happy, smiling faces. So, right, I think that brings us to the end of this meeting. I share. Okay. Or does <laughs> it to approve the minutes officially? Have you approved the minutes yet? No. no, you didn't. I approved, I didn't approved call for a vote. Everybody a liked them. We just need a proposal or a second. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we did it in the chat. Pro the protocol's chat. not my strong point, is it? We do, we do. You're right, dear. We need to formally approve the minutes. Can we formally yeah. approve the minutes? I was happy everybody yeah. did. I think Councillor <laughs> Beach has uh, yeah, I've, proposed I've, them and I've seconded them. Yeah, right. It's been done in the chat. Yeah, it can't be done in the chat, Councillor Beach. It has to be done formally, I'm afraid. I thought so it Councillor might, Beach is proposing. It was worth Councillor a try. Councillor Young seconding. <laughs> Everybody in favour. That's all yeah. that we need to do. Okay. Lovely, uh, thank I'm, you very much. I'm going to brush <laughs> Chair, up it's on, on to you. <laughs> I'm going to brush up on, on uh, meeting protocol and also find some way of reading my chat while I'm concentrating on everything else. But I'm not a multi <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so <laughs> Well, that's what me. Lauren and I are for, Chair. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah well, as you can see, I do need your help. Um, anyhow, thanks very much, everybody. Um, enjoy what you're doing the rest of the evening. It's still not bad out there. So, 